Hi there, I'm Claire McDonald Liu and this is the Family Health Lab. I'm really excited by today's conversation. It's around mental health for children and for young people. It's with my good friend of 20 plus years, Prathul Solanke, clinical nurse in the NHS in Leicestershire. Prath is going to be sharing the therapies that he believes are the most impactful and what he believes underpins really, really good mental health support. You're listening to the Family Health Lab. Healthy parents, healthy kids. We've been friends for a very long time now, and you've agreed to uh, have a chat with me about your work. You're a clinical nurse. That's, that's correct. Oh. How did you get involved in, in therapy for young people? I've worked with adults when I first entered the mental health system for about six years. And I felt that it would just be very interesting to, to, to try and see the roots of the problems before they came into adulthood. And, um, and it's, uh, that was the main reason. And to work with a children there who were hard to reach, or if I put it in a better way, services were hard for them to reach. So that was my main interest in working. And I primarily started working with young offenders and now work across the whole um, the whole team were looked after refugees, fostered and adopted. So lots of the children that you're, you're looking after, the adolescents and young people, um, lots of them are in the care system, aren't they? They're, they're in home, they're look, looked after children. Yeah, so they're not with their birth parents for um, a variety of reasons, mainly through neglect, abandonment and trauma and abuse. And also we also get... Um, you know, a large population of refugees, mainly young males, are coming through from war torn countries, um, having made their journey into the, U- the UK. Right. Yes. You're, I said Leicester, you're, that's the middle of the, uh, of the UK, uh, in the Midlands. Yeah. Sounds like it's been quite a journey, and, and the service uses, a, a, you're seeing a, the, a, the um, demographics changing. What kind of work do you, do you mainly take part in i know you were um, you were a um, prescriber a non-medical prescriber is that right you know, that's uh, my role within the team is as a non-medical prescriber as a senior nurse also uh, i'm a trained cbt therapist so able to offer a one-to-one um, and supports uh, in terms of all the children but yeah so the main issue is engagement and trying to get the working in a part in a partnership with young people is where the CBT role comes in more because you're working in partnership with, with young, with the young people involved. We've had conversations around that before and you, you, you find that highly effective treatment for different types of mental ill health, from anxiety to depression, to, to different, different manifestations of mental ill health. I finally, out of all the treatments that I was working with, especially these hard to reach people, it it was, it was based in the here and now. It was very practical base and it, it wasn't a prescriptive therapy. And those of you who know, know about CBT, it is working in partnership and, and enhancing the skills of your person. So it would work in a collaborative. That, that was the key. I like the sound of that rather than go initially straight off for the medical route, medicalizing, um, using the pharmaceuticals, which are there if they're needed. Um, yeah, you're, and you're, I have a place as well. Absolutely, yeah. You're you're using more in your toolkit than um, than just the pharmaceutical methods. You've you've got these others. Have you got an example of um, somebody you've worked with and and how how you can tell us about how effective CBT um, was for them? One of the young people I worked with uh, was from Afghanistan, and you know his journey here was quite a traumatic. Just the journey from Afghanistan, but his actual experience within Afghanistan um, and growing up in that community. And as far as his experience, he's, he's, he has never known anything other than living in a war torn conflict. Um, and his journey here was very traumatic. But working with him, it, it, it was the engagement side and to build a trusting relationship with him. With him. And rather than having one or two sessions, we had 10 sessions to try and build that. But, you know, uh, working with him, with a translator, he successfully gone on and now he's, um, he's, a, he's a trained mechanic. He, he's doing really well in Leicester. He's really physically comfortable. So 
It was a long journey, but we were very hard to engage with, who was mistrusting, who was aggressive verbally at the time, so we'd have to go and find him. So it was about putting the effort in and giving him a trusting base, but also he was working with his foster carers. I think that was the key for them to understand better how his presentation was. So yeah, yeah, it, it's been a long journey, but that, that was very successful. Yeah. You see him around around town. You see him, and he's doing well. Yeah. He's kind of yeah. in the community. And, and, Great. But he will ring just to ask for advice on on all sorts of things, not just mental health, which is quite interesting. So he, you know, he, you know um, that was very successful. But it didn't take us a long time, and I fear that mainstream services don't have sometimes the time or the. Um, facilities to be able to in, invest in more than three sessions to have an assessment. Mm. It does show you what can be achieved if, if that effort and that holistic approach is, is taken. The team you work within a, a team and they're, they're using different types of approach and they're interested in maybe around nutrition for, for mood to help people feel good and exercise and outdoor time and all, all the Looks, different forms of health. Really- uh, in terms of our looked after children, the children's in um, council run homes, we, we have a specific member of the team who will look after them, do consultation. We're very fortunate that this particular member of our team is, she's a personal trainer in her part-time life, and she brings to that, that enthusiasm. And she's put together um, exercise regimes, vaccines groups for both the workers there and for the children. And that has been quite successful. Um, we've also started to implement with that specific diet for each child and trying to implement that. And obviously there's a constant, but we really are working with the children's homes to Im- implement that. But what this has given is given the children some control over what they eat because they are actually doing the cooking and they are taking over. So it's given that. We've added that alongside work around poetry, work around music. So given a full holistic care in terms of mental health, social and economic factors, and it's a very psychosocial dynamic approach. But the diet part has been really in- interesting because uh, the enthusiasm shown by the children has been really incredible. And it's like hands-on. When, when um, I'm working with families, and they're struggling with food changes and, you know, often coming back to giving back a, a bit of autonomy to the, the um, children. And working with in school settings, I've worked with leads of um, the catering teams and the leads of um, schools who were saying children won't eat it, if we put more salads in. But then yeah. you, you give the power to the um, pupils and they, they, you know, they ask for more vegetables and they, they then help themselves to more from the salad bar. And autonomy around health, nutrition, exercise, it's really, really an important part of, of yeah, getting that control over your health back. Also, I think there's something positive in just the, the dietary needs of these young people in terms of the influences, in terms of the chemical irregularities and trying to have a balanced diet, diet which is ultimately has an effect on their mood and their function mm-hmm. and their mm-hmm. energy as, as well, you know? We're almost trying to eradicate um, the role of medication in some respects, or, or to work around, work alongside. On the social side, the very fact of sharing some food with someone who's prepared it for you, and the conversations that we've had in the kitchen have just have just been um, way ahead of something that we get in a one-to-one therapy type setting. It's been more of a back to the collaborative nature and. And you can be more inquisitive with the children as you're working with them. So then um, it's helped to build that relationship. And also, it's fantastic life skills. Yeah. We've got a lot of 16 to 18 year olds who are moving on. And one skill that we've given them is the, the arts of budgeting, shopping and cooking. It does help and enhance in more ways than just mental health in terms of living skills. These are formative years for them as well in terms of the, the diet and, and also how they handle their, their own mental health and the steps they can take to kind of um, self-manage. So, uh, so lots and lots of skills are a really, really formative time. It sounds, it sounds amazing, the, the work, 
what are the numbers that you're seeing? Have they increased since the pandemic? Are you seeing more uh, adolescents than news? Our numbers have, have rocketed. Um, so when we talk of a caseload of about 20 to 25, each clinician, like, now we're talking 50, 60 plus. Um, and there's been a marked increase in the 16 plus population. Um, through the pandemic, uh, people working in isolation, um, the stress of the exams, not having that support of, of the school, returning back to school once they've been in this isolation, um, it's all added. And I think the, the general headlines that people see in the news have had a massive impact in the general feel of, um, the community as the whole. Um, so yeah, I think the pandemic we've seen increases and what you're finding is, is a lot more complex cases are starting to be apparent. Also financial issues on top of that as well. So again, back to the diet, the standards of living, uh, they're all going to impact on your mood. What are the effects of childhood trauma or stress? What, what do you see in, in their physical or mental health? Well, we see a lot of um, trauma-related things like anger, aggression, loss of anxiety. There, 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 there's lots of maladaptive ways of, of coping. We've seen a massive increase in self-harm. We've seen a rise in suicide rates um, across the country. We've seen lots more children going into care through the care system. And we've seen an increase in um, refugees, Coming forward more, I think they've been there, but I think more, more able to actually, they're, they're asking for help. But I think the urgency is, is, is more identified now, rather than pe- being lost in the system and going into a primary care, such as the GP. Now they're coming into secondary and the third tier group as well. Mm-hmm. So more specialized teams are needed. Yeah. I think that's where it's going. And when you get to the age of 16 plus, you almost, you know, you haven't got long to work with them. So that's, that's been a big issue. In terms of your specialisms, you've mentioned CBT and, and different types of therapies. What, what do you most enjoy? What, what do you find um, the young people respond well to? Engagement. And I think with young, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to anybody to have one-to-one counselling. I would find it difficult to go somewhere. So I always put myself in, in, their, in their shoes. So um, it's engagement and then having a connection with you. So because you, you, you need to have that as a, as a platform. I think our team, we, we really focus on that side uh, of getting to have this relationship and getting to know the young person. I think that is key. But I think it's also key to, to, to have a formulation, to have a direction. It's not just a... I know it's a meet and greet. It's, you know, you're, you, you know, you, you have a plan to help this child. So if you have that form, a formulation and a clear formulation about what their needs are, and then you, uh, with what you have agreed where you're going to go, there's a formalized plan, as well as this relationship that is based on a warm, open relationship. So you have the direction. I think the young people that we meet want to have a containment as well, you know, from okay. a, a Cuddle source. They want that uh, to build that trust and somebody they can rely on, somebody they can speak yeah. to, somebody they, yeah. So relationship building. We've talked about different um, aspects of your work and you, you've, we've talked about um, a lot your clinical team in Leicestershire, which, which you've worked with for many years. You've been running your private practice for a number of years. So is, is that different in, in your approach to um, the private practice, to the the clinical team, because I suppose you're, you're seeing a different type of clientele. It's the same guidance that you follow that in any kind of therapy, you do have a relationship and you're not focused just on, I mean, in both areas, like I said, it's the word holistic. I work a lot in private practice. I get more time to work just with parents. And I think that is a real added value in terms of you get their, you know, their views and you can help them. But sometimes a lot of or parents are saying, no, fix, fix my child. And you're saying, well, you know, there's, there's, very, there's nothing wrong with the child, but maybe it's the whole system here can just be tweaked. I mean, so we could all move forward. So it's more about psychoeducation in my private practice. Mm-hmm. But again, 
to the relationship on a one on a one to one, which is again, which is, which is key. Mm. Uh, it's about all the autonomy and how you build confidence. Like you say, is that through sports? Is that through enhancing what life skills they have? Is that through the whole family move, moving forward and thinking, oh, well, maybe we all need to tweak what we do and how we do it. And I think that's been the most success I have, which is when I get the mum, the dad, and the young person come, and they're all moving together. And I, I found very little resistance to that, which I thought I would get a lot in terms of, you know, telling people, well, maybe if we look at eating at this time or, you know, all preparing this kind of meal, all doing this kind of activity. I think that's been quite, it's been quite useful. I think families have wanted that as well. Somebody else to come in and say, well, maybe we can try and do So yeah, the family work in my primary practice has been greatly and announced by just opening up those shelves of community and asking the parents, is it okay? Can we talk about what you do at home? Can we talk about your lifestyle? You know, but without, without having a critical eye, parents do not want to have that. It's all fault, you know. Um, so I think you have to know your client base and build that relationship. I can imagine a number of your um, your clients want that. They want they want help for their their child or their young person, and they they'd love to be part of that that journey. I and mean, when I when I work with families, um, I find that all couples. I find that when one person is changing their lifestyle habits or their nutrition in isolation, they come across so many different barriers and, yeah. and issues. But when they address um, health and lifestyle changes as, as a unit, it's so much more positive when they're, when they're all in it and they're all trying it together. So I can imagine that's really successful. It is. And, um, and the bonus with this is that you get the younger siblings who come along um, and by observing this kind of behavior, all this lifestyle, they almost walk into it. So it, it has a very positive effect on all, all the family. They can all benefit at the same time. So yeah. I, was, I'm, I was going to ask you, and then you might have already covered it, but what would you like families to know about therapy? I think some, some of us, we, you know, we're a bit concerned about it, maybe coming to it cold, haven't had any experience of of any type of um, therapy or any type of support, what would you like them to, to know? I, I think at the start, I'd say to have that one-to-one -one with the therapist, just to get and ask the questions, you know, just to find out, you know, um, what it's going to entail for them. I think a lot of parents that I see sometimes feel that uh, they want to be left out of it because they think, all right, this, this is the, the child's time. And I think it's important to ask the questions in, in terms of, Actually, what is the therapy that you're offering? Actually, what is, are you going to be talking about? Or, or what's the model of it? So I think what I do, I send them a brief explanation of, of what it is. And then um, after the, the first session, I agree with the young person, I'm a session with the parents, so they can come on board so I can get their point of view and just give them a direction of where we're going. So there's lots of, I mean, I see the old child must be one or two hours or once a week or twice or once every two weekly. Where they're in the chart, they're with parent twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more early on to 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 recognise um, that parents may not know fully what this entails, and to give them a, a full picture, because I think they might feel that it's almost we're not looking to blame parents. You know, this is not a fault finding mission to say, "Wait, you need to change your parenting." This is what happened in the past. We, we know that at the minute, the lifestyle situations, peer pressure, social media, expectations all have an impact on the family. So yeah, it's giving the, the parents more information and more time, I think, one-to-one. -one. Makes sense. It's such a good approach. It's the, again, it sounds like it's about the relationship building, building, building trust and helping them with their expectations and understanding so they can support the work. So it, it makes makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, to to finish with, I was I was going to ask you: Do you have a suggestion of a particular resource you'd like to recommend for families? It could be a book or um, particular talk or anything that you think is 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 useful. I can put a link. There's a couple of things that there's um, um, and this is slightly going away from CDC, but I think it's really useful. Uh, it's about um, um, self compassion. And there's someone called Paul Gilbert, who's a guru on self-compassion. So, and there's lots of him on YouTube. So 
I think that if you can build this self-compassionate way of thinking, you know, where, you know, you're kinder to yourself, it, 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 it's a really useful tool to have in your toolkit. And I think being kinder to yourself encompasses mental health, physical fitness, relationships, diet, sleep, and, and, and it just captures it. And when I've been working with parents, when I've been choosing the self-compassion, and that's, that, that really has helped us so much. Well, there's also this book here, which is uh, 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 a nice, lots of activities in there, but there's a lot of fun things. I find it's really a colorful and, and, and parents can print off and read and do with the children. So it's more fun-based games. I would say uh, I've got lots of books and lots of toys and lots of games, board games especially. I've got board games, which I use all the time for thinking, feeling, and doing board game. I'll send you the link and I'll give it to parents. And they say, my God, we have loved this because we've not watched TV. We're sat around and it's questions that I've asked. And it's about thinking, feeling, and doing. And they said, I never, I found out so much about my child just through this one board game. And that child was able to talk through the board game. So I will send that link. Yeah. I'll give it to a parent who, has not brought it back yet, but I've, you know, it wasn't me, but I have <laughs> enjoyed that from you <laughs> in the past. And it's I've got, I've got all my resources. That one board game is the best, and I always use it on every assessment that, uh, that I have. Uh, and, and parents are they always ask me, play. so that one, the thinking, feeling, and doing board game. I'll send you the link. Don't I? Yeah, please. I, and I, I echo that because we did borrow that. And it, oh, yes. it, yeah, yeah, but I, I give it back. <laughs> and uh, it was about um, giving you a different way to connect um, yeah. and talk and different conversational points that you might, and, and just getting to those quicker and everyone's in the same boat. So again, all that building of trust, relationship, connection, um, yeah, and the other other resources, they they found really yeah. really good too. And it's, like, it's, and it's quite a fun thing. I know we're selling other emotions, but it was quite it's quite a fun little yeah. game. It's like, right, yeah, it is fun. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. And and um, building that um, compassion and that self talk, I, I love that that kind of under underpins um, what you're doing and what you're you're putting out yeah. there as you're making a difference with people. So thank you. It's been really nice talking to you, Prabhu. Well, thank you. I appreciate that on a rainy Sunday morning in the Midlands. But for thanks for chatting. Yeah, it's nice talking to you. Yeah.